I think everybody's getting really creative as a result of us having to, you know, keep our distance. Right. I hear you on there, Kelly. Hi. <laughs> this, is this is Lisa from Patton. Hi, Lisa. Nice to hear you. Yes. You guys have been putting great stuff out, so thank you so much. I've been forwarding stuff and retweeting awesome. things. Are you all exhausted? I think we're all on, like, all the time right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's how it's been. I, I wrote a little thing on self-care and doing online and homework, like working from home teleworking. And um, I thought, wow, I didn't listen to that because I haven't taken a break all day. I know. I've had, there's my alarm <laughs> to come online. Um, I've been trying to take breaks as able, but between the e-learning for my own kids and um, working for patents and trying to feed everyone. It's, it's been quite chaotic. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know. We didn't even eat lunch today. I think you all were very busy as well. Yeah, definitely. I had <laughs> prepared my notes for the Twitter chat, and I can't find them. That's how, how much stuff I have open on my desktop. I understand. I think we were all teasing about the number of tabs that we have open right now. Uh huh. It's humorous, like trying to get through by the end of the day to shut them all down. <laughs> I'm trying to like scan and look for it because I don't know where it is. And then I, Kristen's on. I'm wondering if Karen Davies is coming on because I thought it would be awesome if she had some time to get on to practice Zoom a little bit. Oh, there's a ton of you on. Hey, David. Hi, Jenna. I like that uh, graphic. It's good. And Jessica's on and Kelly. There's a lot of you guys on here. Yeah, it's good looking. So are you recording or will you be? I think Daniel is, David. Yeah, it's already recording. Yeah, good evening, everybody. It's 8.01, so let's get this officially started. Uh, we are going to try and record this and make it available for folks who couldn't be here tonight, but of course, being here live and interactive is going to be the most beneficial and exciting, but I do want to try to record it, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm so glad that we have such a good crowd rolling in here. We've got 41 people in the room so far, and then everybody else, we've got hopefully on the Twitter chat side, and, and several of us will be jumping back and forth. So this is a brand new experience for us, running both a live Zoom and a Twitter chat at the same time. So thanks for jumping in with both feet with patents and being bold in this unique and uncertain time when our students and our colleagues really need us to be creative and brave. I have just a couple of things that I need to, uh, to, to put out there, housekeeping wise, because we are having this live captioned, and thank you so much, Shannon, for providing that service for us. So number one, uh, when you're gonna speak, please introduce yourself by name as the speaker, and two, uh, try not to talk over one another, which kinda is hard sometimes on, a, on an online platform like this because there might be a little bit of a delay between when I say something and when you receive it through your speakers. So sometimes there's a little bit of talking over each other, um, but as long as you're aware of it, we can try to slow down and give a little more space between when we say something and when we expect a response from someone else. Um, so we do have live closed captioning, so please do use your microphone uh, to offer your ideas and your questions and your suggestions and to dis discuss your responses to the Twitter chat questions when those do happen at 8.30. So from 8 to 8.30, this Zoom room will be open just like it is now to simply play around and become familiar with Zoom, as it might be a tool that you end up using with your students and your colleagues in the next several weeks. And also to ask questions of each other, get to know who's here, share ideas, etc. Then at 8.30 sharp, the Twitter check questions will begin and they'll proceed until 9 p.m. and then it's bedtime. 
So thanks so much for being here and uh, I'm excited and, and let's do this. So I'll open it up and I'll turn my microphone off for the time being and let, uh, let some discussion happen. Oh, also, you've got several patent staff here. You've also got some true experts from out in the field, all around the state, actually from out of the state as well. So if you've got questions and ideas, let's, let's put them out here. You've got a good group of people here to bounce some ideas off of. So who wants to monitor the Zoom group chat and the Twitter to get all of this stuff together? Yeah, so I'm going to, at 8.30, David, I'm going to take the, the questions. They'll be posted here on, um, in, in the screen share, but I'll also put them in the, in the chat window. And then um, I'll bring up, I'll leave them up there for a little bit, and then I'll bring up the, uh, the tweets as they're happening as well. Okay. I'll also try to put anything that's really relevant from the Twitter chat into the chat box in Zoom as well. Perfect. Thanks, Kelly. So I'm looking through the chat window now. Um, let's let's uh, let's hear from somebody who's here. Where are you from? Introduce yourselves. I see a lot of familiar names, but also a lot of new ones. Well, I'm Tammy Perkey. I uh, work at the Indiana School for the Blind, and I am in the Noblesville area. I guess that didn't work. That worked, Tammy, I heard you, and we're so glad you're here. <laughs> this is all new to me. You're I'm doing that, great so far. I'm in that upper age of technology, or young. I'm in the upper ages trying to get used to this new technology stuff. We paused just to trick you. Oh, I see how you are. <laughs> Welcome to Patton's <Patents> ICAM. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, feel free to introduce yourself in the in the chat window as well as with your voice but don't be afraid to play with your microphone um turn it on see what it sounds like make sure it works and hopefully uh you'll become a little more familiar and comfortable with using a tool like this going forward in the next few weeks with your students and your colleagues on that keyboard <laughs> We've got Emily Spencer, a fourth grade teacher at the Indiana School for the Blind and Visually Impaired as well. Glad you're here, Emily. And Darla is waiting for her loud child and husband to exit the room. Darla, just turn on the mic. Let us hear it all. <laughs> All right, so people are clearly more comfortable typing in the chat window for now. Can you hear me? There you are, Darla, I hear you. Okay, I got him out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks guy. for hosting you guys, this is awesome. Thanks for being here. Where are you from, Darla? Tell everybody else. I am from Carmel, Indiana. I work for Carmel Clay Schools and we are venturing into e-learning for the very first time tomorrow. Very exciting. Excellent. What are you most worried about? Um, probably our accessibility with Canvas. I, it, we've been practicing with Canvas for a while. I think teachers are pretty comfortable and familiar with um, how it's working in their classroom on the day to day, but just a ton of questions coming in, a lot about captioning, a lot about making sure kids are going to be able to have tests read and quizzes read through Canvas. And so it's been a, it's been a whirlwind of a week. Yeah. Well, we're glad you're here. Thanks. Hey, everyone. This is Louise calling from, uh, well, not calling, video conferencing from Florida. You can see that at the beach there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah as you can see, the uh, beaches are empty. Actually, they're not, which is the problem. <laughs> it's spring break, and people are not social dis socially distancing. Welcome, Luis. We're glad you're here. Glad to be here. 
Yeah, this is awesome. We've got 47 people in here now. Uh, and I see a couple more introductions in the chat window. Chris Floyd, Project Lead the Way engineering teacher at Brownsburg. Uh, Chris, are you uh, going to be doing some e-learning with your students through Project Lead the Way in engineering? It says we are going to give it a try in the chat window. Awesome. What's your greatest worry about, about starting it, Chris? Well, that is a big worry, but we're glad to see that that's on your radar. Chris says, just making sure that all students have accessibility. Uh, we've got, we've got Sarah, a K-6 life skills teacher, who says this time off and remote learning is going to be extra hard for my class. Uh, what do you think is gonna be extra hard, Sarah? What are you most worried about getting started with? Hi, um, Sarah. I decided to unmute. Um, we had two days of e-learning back to back a couple weeks ago, and like the behavior spiked, and my parents were really confused and concerned because we're one-to-one -one Chromebooks. Um, even though I do it in my classroom with my students, um, they get a little confused when they're at home doing like schoolwork. Um, so I'm just really concerned for my families um, getting through like these next three weeks because we're going to be three weeks off um, and doing technology based learning instead of like hands on learning. Yeah, it certainly involves a lot of changes and I had a, a conversation today an interview with um, a reporter who was specifically asking about that um, at one point and that being families, parents becoming, you know, assuming that teaching role, uh, which is a really difficult thing. And, and teachers, you know, us becoming sort of the facilitator from a distance is a lot different than being able to observe it in person and provide the hands-on and, and, the, and the prompting that sometimes is, is physical, but, but really just having that experience of seeing it and, and, and hearing it and uh, being in the same space with it. It's a lot different when you're at a, in a remote location and relying on somebody else to, to deliver those props. Well, we see I have somebody else concerned about remote learning for my students with disabilities, especially because many of them do not have devices or access at home and the libraries are also closed, absolutely. How do we provide access and support for students remotely without technology? I know there's some people here who've got some experience with that, so I'll close my mouth and let some others respond to that one. I'll hop on and um, answer. This is Jessica Conrad. Um, so one of the questions that I've been asking teams right now is why is it that they don't have access to the technology that perhaps should have been in the IEP? Um, as we know, it's the case conference committee decision whether the student needs access to um, you know, a Chromebook or an AAC device or switches or whatever that is. So making sure that, um, you know, lesson learned, did you have that conversation with your case conference committee? Um, but of course, the other part is, you know, what technology do they have access to? I saw Kelly um, brought up, or Dr. Kelly brought up, um, you know, do they have access to a phone? Is there a smartphone or even just a landline? Can they have access to that? Because that might be something you can leverage as well. Yeah, good advice. Yeah, good point too. Uh, landline will also work with Zoom. So you don't have to have a computer to log into a Zoom room. 
you can call in with the phone. If you do that, uh, they'll remember that it is a different experience. You know, you have to identify yourself, you know, just some good practices uh, for video conferencing in general. Just make sure you identify yourself because people may not recognize you speaking if you're in a group conversation. And then, uh, you know, avoid things like over here and over there. So use descriptive language. It's really important. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Luis. You guys, I have a question for you regarding what do you think this process is going to do for us all long term? Like, do you see that we're going to have a boom maybe of accessibility questions? And do you think that moving forward, this is going to be kind of a great learning experience for everybody? Because I feel like my district already is starting to look and look at things very differently very quickly. Well, I'll tell you what I told the reporter today real quickly, and then I'll let others answer. I think absolutely this is going to have a lasting and very positive impact on education in general. And what I said earlier was that, you know, we've been doing this sort of thing for many, many years, and it just never gets put on the front burner. It's kind of like, oh, there's something else we got to focus on right now. We know accessibility and assistive tech and accessible materials are important, but it's not our number one priority, and it just kind of keeps getting pushed to the back burner. And right now, it is the only burner. And so it has become, it's become urgent in nature and so I think the lessons learned through this and the, and the skills and the experiences will definitely have positive lasting uh, effects on education in general and, and then while it's difficult right now I'm pretty excited about that in the long term. Good question Darla. Anybody else have any other thoughts on that? What the, what the lasting impact might be of this uh, of this of this urgency that we're experiencing around distance learning and, and accessibility in general? Uh, this is Louis speaking. I, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, if you look at web accessibility, uh, the move to mobile devices, you know, uh, about a decade ago or so, uh, really prompted a lot of people to think about. Uh, web accessibility just because we were using technology in a different way. And so this could be one of those shifts where we start to think about things a little bit differently and how do we create, uh, you know, accessible experiences uh, becomes even more important, like you mentioned, Daniel, uh, in this kind of environment. Luis, this is Kelly Grillo. So I was laughing with somebody looking at theta guidance from 2012, 13, and 14. And I said, wow, what this is truly going to do for education is push us 20 years forward where we should actually be because it's hitting us all at the same exact time. And we're all realizing the skills that we lack even people that have felt like they've been fluent. Um, I know that Jessica was posting some things um, from her SLP peeps that I was having to read in depth and really sharpen my skills to sharpen and support my team. So even things that us AKA experts are pretty good at navigating when we're being demanded to support others, I feel like it's just gonna push all of our skills to a level that's unbelievable. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I see a, a comment from Karen Janowski. This was sent to two parents in my home district and was reiter reiterated repeatedly. A district is not required to provide services to students with disabilities during extended school closures if the district does not provide any educational services to students during this period of time. They are not providing services to avoid meeting the needs of students on IEPs, which seems unethical to me. I agree that seems incredibly unethical, but that, that is the case. If there's not services being provided educationally to all students, then I think that is the, that is the, the case. Um, however, if there is educational content and experiences being provided to, to all students, then uh, my understanding is that accommodations and services have to be provided according to IEP as well. Um, I wonder, Karen, how in, in your in your district that you're referring to, how many um, has there been a, a number of days given as permissible to not have school at all? It's been twenty. It's twenty days here in Indiana. So e-learning doesn't count as educational services. 
e-learning days do, but school closure doesn't. Wow. Well, hopefully there's some more guidance coming for you in that regard, Karen. That is shocking. Hi, can you hear me? This is yes, Karen. Yes, we hear you. Yeah, it is pretty shocking, and I'm finding that it is the standard here in Massachusetts. They are just refusing to um, address the needs of any students, and by doing that, that absolves them of the responsibility of meeting the needs of students on IEPs. It seems to be the way that they are addressing it, and, and it's really appalling, unethical, and to me, educational malpractice. It's pretty disturbing. I agree. That's the first time I've heard of that, um, and it's very disturbing. So that's not happening in other parts of the country, that they are, um, they are sending home materials for all students? At least from my experience so far in Indiana, that's, that's not been um, what I've experienced here. What about anybody else? I, this is Darla from Corwell. I am like in shock right now at hearing that because I, it has been nothing but clearly communicated to us that the integrity of our work with our, with our identified students is to continue on and our case conferences are moving forward and our goals are to be monitored still. And so, yeah, that's, that's a crazy situation. I think of all those kids out there just not receiving any services. That's reassuring to hear. This is Karen Janowski again. That's reassuring to hear that other parts of the country are dealing with it in a more effective way than we are. I know my company has reached out to all 35 different directors of student services in our area to say we are available to help. But again, they're saying, you know, we aren't responsible for any learning happening during these 21 days. Thank you. But, and maybe we'll, we will reach out. Yes, yeah, someone says, what, where's the educa educational equity? If you're not offering services to, to general education services, you're absolved of any um, services to students on IEPs. Are the parents not rioting over that? <laughs> I know. I think that they keep having it drilled into them from the DOE um, document that says only if services are provided to all students. Are, they, are you then expected to meet the needs of students on IEPs? So again, it's, it's, it, it just frees them from that requirement. It's pretty appalling. Hmm. Hi, this is Glenda. I'm an occupational therapist from Lawrence Township. And I agree with Darla. I feel like our OTs and SLPs have been work, working very hard the last two days, making packets, figuring out how to get um, services out to our kids. Hi, Glenda. Hi, Darla. <laughs> I miss you. I miss you. <laughs> well, so can we talk just for a minute? I'm curious what everybody else is doing with SLP services. Um, I feel like there's been a lot of fast and furious talk about what telepractice should look like. Should it, should we be venturing into telepractice? We've never done it before. I'd love to hear everybody's ideas and shout out to Jessica because you have been sharing so many resources over the last 24 hours that have been immensely helpful. From an OT and PT standpoint, I, I worked with our PT today. We tried to come up with just some um, visuals for stretching, yoga, um, sent out sensory visuals for calming. A lot, a lot of it right now is just sending visuals and emailing parents and asking them, what do you need? <laughs> hey, this is Beth Moss from Wayne Township. And um, I love what the last thing you said about asking parents what they need, because I think that some of what's happening right now is this push to like, push all this information to families and parents, and we haven't stopped to ask them what they need in order to be successful at home. Um, so that was a great comment. This hey, is Jessica, Lord. can I ask you a question? Do that around. Beth, how about Beth, how about you? What, are you sending AAC devices home for the first time with anybody? So we already were sending home AAC devices, but with families who wanted them to come home, 
um, we weren't sending them home with everybody. We would offer it to any of our students who had uh, communication devices written into their IEPs. And um, we did, <laughs> we, we put a few barriers in place just to kind of help with managing. So we had family needed to come in for a training session, which obviously could be a barrier, but also was important for them to understand how the device worked and expectations. Um, but of the 45 kids I have using devices, there was only about seven families that opted for that. Um, and I have a lot of kids right now that don't have devices at home. And so as we look at more long term, that's one of the things that's on our list is how do we, how do we do this? How do we get them their devices in their hands when we closed all of a sudden and really couldn't even come up with a plan? This is some great discussion. Keep it going. I'll just throw another another question slash comment in here to maybe uh, provoke some more thought. Um, I'm curious what other places are doing with regard to holding case conferences and communicating with all of the parties that are required to be in those case conference committees and and the timelines involved with those. Are you are you proceeding with case conferences or what's happening? Hi, this is Sarah Emmer. Um, I actually just held a case conference this afternoon at two o'clock. Um, we did a Zoom call. I got everyone involved. I invited them. I scheduled it and it linked to their Google Calendar. Um, it was great. They just clicked on the link. Mom just did it on her phone. Um, it actually worked out really, really well. We all thought it was our first Zoom call doing it this way. Um, and then I digitally set her, the, digitally set her, sorry, that's my daughter, set her the um, IEP and then used Adobe and she digitally signed it and then emailed it back to us. So that was our first time dabbling in that and I thought it worked out really, really well. Yeah, good to hear. So you're saying we're going to be creative, uh, you know, something uh, AT professionals are not familiar with improvising and being creative, being sarcastic. <laughs> so has anybody out there dealt with like resistant buildings? I have a couple of buildings that are on board. We're using Z um, Zoom. Um, I've actually practiced from the last couple of e-learning days, but I have one very res like resistant building and obviously I have to have meetings with that team. And so I'm having a little bit of a challenge. What are you all suggesting? So I see a couple of comments uh, coming in. Um, one was about Zoom offering free accounts right now. Another comment from Sarah saying that uh, without having a paid license, Zoom isn't HIPAA and FERPA compliant. So a couple of things there that I'm not an expert on because they just happened, but uh, Zoom is offering free accounts. I don't know what level that free account is, but also just today was announced a relaxation of, of FERPA and HIPAA compliancy requirements. Ah, uh, Zoom keyboard shortcuts from Luis. That's awesome. And, and so Kelly, you think add in there the the thing that was announced today? I believe only applies to HIPAA. Is that right? Or can anyone share anything that says that it's HIPAA and FERPA? Good question. I don't know. So schools would need to be paying attention to anything related to FERPA. So Zoom is FERPA compliant. They have a FERPA statement and a PDF document right on their site. I have the paid version. I don't believe they insure for the free version. However, with their new expanded toolkit for educators until the end of this year, it absolutely covers the FERPA compliance. One of the, the HIPAA things that I saw on Zoom is that it does end-to-end -end encryption and then it oh, the doc 
the document actually addresses the uh, the laws by the letter of the law if you pull it up um, and all of the newest accounts if you do the verification with your school districts not like the old style free version like so it's an upgraded level of it's it's a the paid version is now free so if that makes any sense yeah excellent all right so we've got just one minute until the twitter chat starts so i just want to point out a couple things in the chat window uh, Louise posted the FERPA guidance on COVID-19 from the Department of Education. Um, we will try to make this recording available and also the, the, the information that was posted in the chat window available. And with that said, we've got just about 30 seconds before the Twitter chat starts. So feel free to stay here in the Zoom window. We're going to try to make the Twitter chat accessible to people who maybe not, don't have a Twitter account or aren't comfortable in Twitter yet. So stay here and participate in the Twitter chat through Zoom which could be a really cool experience. And like Kelly said, do bear with us because this is our first time trying this out, um, but we're pretty excited about it. Or, and or, feel free to jump over and join right in the Twitter chat as well if you are comfortable with that. And with that said, it's 8.30, so let's start it. So I'll post question number one in the chat window and I'll also put it on the screen, there we go, I think it's working. So why should accessibility be considered for e-learning days, also known as remote learning or distance learning? That's question one. Okay, so this is Kelly Grillo. I'm gonna say that holding a Zoom chat via like Twitter mode is highly accessible for a person like me. This moves really fast. So typically I pre-write all of my answers and I can't find my document from pre-writing and having way too much open. So this absolutely engages far more students in the conversation in learning. So if we're truly gonna think about education and opening education for all we have to absolutely think of all those modes that people must engage and you all are modeling that greatly tonight doing a twitter chat via zoom okay so i'm going to try to jump over and show the twitter chat feed now All right, almost there. All right, I think it should be showing now. So what I did here for anyone maybe not as familiar with Twitter yet, is I just did a search for our hashtag, which is the pound sign and then Patton's ICAM, P-A-T-I-N-S-I-C-A-M. So Jenna has introduced herself. She's our Twitter host. Okay. So I hear that it needs to be a little larger. It looks like if I enlarge it on my screen, it doesn't work. I'm actually trying to do this on two computers and a phone right now. And Daniel, uh, if you go, go into settings on TweetDeck, you can change the font to a larger font. Well, this is just on the um, Twitter, Twitter website, but I can jump over here to TweetDeck. Settings. Hey guys, it's Darla again. I'm just gonna jump in with a oral answer to this question number one. 
I don't know if anybody is feeling this right now, but I feel like I am in the Super Bowl and I have been leading up to this for like five years and I haven't had to explain to anybody why anything needs to be accessible. I feel like everybody is just rushing to me right now and saying, oh my gosh, everything has to be online. So now I have to really like dive in deep to all of this. And it's in a way it's awesome that something has kind of pushed something in this direction that I feel like people are taking a lot of personal responsibility right now. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Darla. So that's, it's my, my font is on its largest setting. Let me see, maybe it's better to go back to the, just the straight Twitter feed and see if I can make it larger over here. Uh, there we go. How's that looking? I'm hungry. By the way, uh, if you have any children in the background, totally allowed. It's great to hear the little voices. We haven't had a choice all day. <laughs> I see a, a comment in the Twitter chat from Ashley Dawson. I think she makes a really good point that uh, the littlest learners, uh, you can't expect them to do a packet of work by themselves or navigate tech alone. They need some support in doing that. Hey, Luis, it's Hillary. I agree because we've done a distance learning plan in our district and we did pre-K through six and we gave some options and a menu and it was very, very powerful to give parents that choice and flexibility and that stuff to do as a family. So it's kind of UDL-esque. So it's not just the you know, lack of a better word, the standard way of doing things. It's pick here, pick here, but also do this, like read to your child, X, Y, Z, play with your child. Some of the things that I think we've lost in education that are so integrally important that our feedback, the parents are super jazzed about what we're doing for that. So I think that's, that's something that we need to get back to once we get back into school. Cool. Yeah, I agree. We are, uh, Jenna just posted question two. Question two is if a student's IEP has listed accommodations, are schools required to provide those accommodations during e-learning? Please explain why or why not. So obviously this group addressed that in our pregame show, but in terms of continuing to make sure that extended, I've been calling e-learning lately, extended e-learning. 
So when teachers are exploring kind of the formats and routines that they're going to use in an extended period of time, three and four weeks, um, my district area teams have met to talk about what that might look like. Um, it's funny that you just mentioned choice boards because we want to make sure that parents feel empowered because it's a lot of juggling if you're thinking, you know, reading, writing, science, social studies, all the things, you know, social, emotional, we're trying to fit in, you know, the SLPs request on top of all those other services. So we've said, why can't we send home some menus so that it feels good and it empowers the parents? to have some choice that fits in with their family and their lifestyle. Because we don't know where kids are gonna be. Like if parents are healthcare providers, these kids might be, you know, vagabonds going to grandma's. So we've really been kind of creative, I think, in the two area districts I serve. Um, one principal shared zeros aren't good enough. So she's gonna be combing grade books during this extended e-learning time because one or two zeros from two e-learning days, that might not be a big deal, but for kiddos with IEPs, you know, seven zeros, eight zeros can accumulate and impact overall learning and grades. Yeah, I actually really like that a lot, and I really commend that principle. So zeros during e-learning time really is indicative of a much bigger problem. And to me, it's indicative of accommodations not being put in place through distance learning. Um, so to take that stand as a, as a school administrator and say absolutely no zeros, if there's zeros, I'm really going to look hard into this is a, a really powerful stand and, a, and an important one to take, I think, for, on behalf of our students. Daniel, to back that up, though, she's really provided her teachers a lot of support and ways to collaborate and use some tools collaboratively so that it's not all like one person's job to do all and be all. Um, some people, you know, might not come to that invitation. Others may. So she's going to hold the standard, I think, pretty high for kiddos. That's awesome. I think that's awesome. So we're on question three. Uh, I went too, went too far there. So question three, what are some ways to ensure that your e-learning materials are accessible for all students? I'll jump back over to uh, the Twitter the Twitter feed now. So this is Jessica Conrad. I've been thinking about this a lot this week, talking to my sister. So I grew up in a household where our primary caregiver was not literate. So the idea of a teacher sending home a packet full of things that a parent was supposed to help with or a lesson plan that they could follow, that would have been really, really hard. So I really appreciate seeing um, all these videos and lots of different ways that teachers are offering this so that all of our families can participate. Um, you know, just knowing that if you're expecting someone to be a homework helper, um, they might not be coming with all the skills that you might expect. Yeah, good points, Jessica. <clears throat> This is Luis. I just wanted to mention the uh, National AIM Center and our partner, CETA. We've uh, curated a number of our resources in a one-page uh, location on the CETA website. That's the State Educational Technology Directors Association. And I posted that link in the chat here, and I'll try to post it in the uh, Twitter uh, chat as well. Thanks, Luis. This question actually also reminds me of another question that I was asked uh, by the reporter this morning or this afternoon. Um, and that was about, again, about the lasting effects that this might have on um, education, even after we go back to a face-to-face -face situation. And I think there's going to be a lot more emphasis placed on uh, creating, curating, and purchasing materials that are accessible from the very start. Hillary here, isn't that the point we've been trying to make for however long? I mean, we've talked about making things accessible from the get-go. Now we're in a situation where there is no other alternative. We've been forced to do this, and I'm not sure how I feel about that, but I think it's really important. 
accessibility from the start, from the start, from the start, and really helping people understand and bring it to light that this really truly is best practice. And this is how we need to do it. And we'll help you get there. But now you're listening. Now, like you have no other choice. So it's almost like there's, there's a weird eerie positive in all of this chaos and conundrum that look, we have the tools, we have the, the ability to support it and we're able to meet more learners in this way. I absolutely agree. Yeah, definitely. And like I said, it's sort of been on, it's been on the radar, but kind of put on the back burner because it hasn't been urgent. And right now it's urgent. It's the only thing, it's the only thing on the burner. And so it's absolutely of an urgent nature. And I do think there's many positives that will come out of that. So one of the things I had a conversation with some folks at um, CEC and um, eLuma, they're a private therapy company providing therapy from a distance. Um, they are going to be co-hosting a Twitter or a CEC webinar. And we have online materials that have curated fully accessible tools. And so instead of relying on the strength of us individually, what we need to be doing is making sure that we isolate what we're trying to teach, looking at the standard and moving to platforms that have curated awesome web content that also do things like UDL checking. So I moved from Florida and they have this great resource called CPOM and they talk about the accessibility in those review of materials. So we have definitely done a good job in the last 12 years of crowdsourcing. It's just knowing where those trusted sources are and if you think about what we were trying to do with Common Core, and I know that's a dirty word and everybody has their own standards, in a time like this, if every single one of our states and all of our experts that work tirelessly were working towards the set of same standards, think of how powerful the tools and access would look. I mean, we kind of get it right when we share across state lines, but there's so few of us in every single state, it feels like, that crowdsourcing and taking a look at things and kind of evaluating what exists for the ability to be accessible. Um, I don't know how many of you use Seesaw, but I got to see amazing lessons in their library today where teachers are embedding voice, allowing multiple modes of expression, allowing all these great materials. So I think it's really cool that if we know the guideline or the checklist or how to evaluate a piece with that UDL lesson plan format, we can totally evaluate, find, and share and kind of crowdsource the ratings of highly rated and highly accessible. We need a way to share those things a little bit easier. Absolutely. And so we're on question four now. I'll read that out. What are some ways to make your e-learning instruction and materials accessible for students who are blind or low vision, deaf and hard of hearing, and or have intensive needs? This is Tammy Perky. I feel this is really important because I have kids that have really high needs and I feel like I have to be with them and physically working with them to get them to learn. So any input on this would be most helpful to me. This is Jessica Conrad. I feel like I can speak to this really well because this is a model I've been using for the last four years myself. And the last, I don't know, since Friday, I've been um, cramming like I'm back in um, undergrad again on everything that the research says about telehealth and students with complex communication needs and, um, you know, that population that needs our most support. 
and the research keeps coming back like it, there's not a ton of research on it, but it's a very promising practice. The answer seems to be you do need a helper, whether that's you know a family member or something like that with that student, but you are kind of shifting what you're providing, if you can at all provide it live, is coaching that helper and reacting to that student um, every time they make a response. So recordings don't seem to be working as well. Um, not that like Dora the Explorer Blue's Clues kind of thing where you pause and wait. It's reacting to that student each and every time and helping form those dendrites and letting them know, hey, the thing on the screen really is helping and helping that caregiver, that person who's with that student, coaching them to carry on what that is. Um, and I could go on and on about it. But that's really what the webinar is about tomorrow. Yeah, great points, Jessica. When, what, what, what webinar is that tomorrow? Um, it is called Core Word Workouts, the Distance Learning Edition. So um, we are shifting. It was going to be more about core words, but that'll certainly be a part of it. But what I'm hearing from people who um, filled out that link, and I'll pop it in again, is tell me how to do this distance-wise. How does this even look? How does my computer even look? So we're going to be focusing on those kind of questions. Excellent. And what time is that, and how do people sign up? Uh, I'll pop it in. So it's two times. Um, 12 p.m. tomorrow Eastern and then 8.30 a.m. Eastern on Friday. Excellent. But I think the answer um, is yes, these students can absolutely participate in e-learning. It does have to look a little different, but um, all the good stuff that we know for all students certainly applies for this population as well. Yeah, great. And uh, for anybody who didn't see it, I think you popped that link to register for those in the chat window, right, Jessica? Yep. Thanks. Awesome. This is Darla. Are you guys going to be hosting some more of your uh, caption um, presentations that you guys give out occasionally? The captioning? Hey, Darla. Video? This is Jenna Fallbush. Hi, Jenna. Hey, yes. We have one on Thursday scheduled at 3, 3 o'clock, I think. Let me check the calendar. And so you can still get registered for that or we can, you know, put another date on the calendar if Thursday's not good. Thank you. Yeah. And so for anyone that's here, if you would like to attend that, I can, I'll grab the registration link. And then also you can request it at any time, um, you know, that works better for you and we can figure out another date. Yeah, just as a quick reminder or, or information for people who may be new to us here, how much do those, um, how much do those trainings cost to attend from patents? They're free, no cost to you. And I just shared a caption document that we have, uh, Katie and I have been crowdsourcing caption resources on in the Twitter chat, but I can also share that in Zoom. Awesome, and we are in question five. What are some ways to make your e-learning instruction and materials accessible for students with specific learning disabilities, such as dyslexia? Offering lots of different choices. <laughs> you guys model this constantly. So allowing all those to tools like screen readers and multiple modes of engagement and expression. So I looked at a woman's um, lesson today and she had this wonderful characterization chart and you could write about it, you could talk it out, or you could do a video note. And it was done so well in so many different areas and it allows for creativity and choice. I think when we empower kiddos to express themselves in the mode that they feel most safe and then scaffold to those ones that we <clears throat> might test with, with or without appropriate accommodations, um, we tend to get more out of our kids.
So I'm still jumping back and forth here between the Zoom and the, the Twitter chat. Looks like we've got great resources being shared in both places. So again, as a reminder, we will uh, um, share the recording of the Zoom meeting uh, and also the chat that happened in the Zoom meeting. But every time we have a Twitter chat, we have these Twitter chats every Tuesday night, by the way, at 8.30 p.m. We've been having them for a few years now. We archive them all in an accessible document and make them accessible to you after the Twitter chat as well. Um, so again, live participation is the best, but if you miss one on a Tuesday night, go back and get that archive of, of all the, the resources and, and knowledge that was shared on that uh, Tuesday night Twitter chat. Those are all available on the Patents website. So we're just about four and a half minutes from the end here, and we're on question six. We still got 50 people in the Zoom room, and who knows how many people in the Twitter chat hang in there. You got like four minutes left. Question six is, what are some ways you can meet the needs of your students when technology is not available for them? This is a good question. This came up in our Zoom uh, pregame show as well. I see Jessica posted a question. Uh, do we get PGPs for this experience? Absolutely. Just a short link that will be shared at the end here. You have to just click that link and uh, fill out a little bit of information about your experience. Reflect just a little bit. It takes a little bit of time. And then you'll immediately be, be emailed your professional growth point for your time spent with us this evening. Yeah, so the phone, it looks like it's been mentioned several times, both during this and also during our uh, pre-Zoom meeting before the Twitter chat. Also, again, just this has been mentioned as well, but I'll reiterate the, uh, the concept of a choice board. You know, it could be technology as one of the choices, but there could be other things as well. So that offers student choice, but it also offers options as far as the accessibility of different types of, of uh, materials being presented. And Hillary, I, I'm not sure if you're in the Zoom meeting still, but I see in the Twitter chat that you've been doing some cool things for months with really good results uh, for students with complex needs to participate in teletherapy and distance learning. If you can elaborate on that at all, either in the Zoom window and or in the chat, or, that'd be awesome. Yeah, sure, Dan, I'm still here. Um, okay, cool. We have several students in our district that have complex medical needs that are immunocompromised from the start. And so the minute cold and flu season, I'm from Maine, so the minute cold and flu season hits, we go into action where kids are home. And one of the students in particular that I'm thinking about um, has very complex needs, um, nonverbal, all of that. We were able to go into the home and do some distance learning where we flipped it and used Hangouts to connect to classrooms and have some switch access opportunities and some stories read 
now we're in complete lockdown where that's we're not able to physically even be in the room but we've trained the parent in that hangout so i'm working on connecting with the parent to do a hangout with them in terms of supporting that work moving forward we've also used telepresence technology in the form of robots when they could be physically present in the school this was before school closure now we're getting approval to get hangouts enacted so that therapists can actually rem remote in with parents and actually do therapy in that modality where the parents are kind of acting as the hands the therapists are acting as the guide but we're still providing faith because that's the goal um personally i'm excited about it because i think it's something that's underutilized when we have kids that are immunocompromised but we can still provide high quality services in this way and um i'm eager to do more about it with the things that are happening right now our utmost goal is to make sure our kids are safe and healthy. And, you know, if I even have a scratchy throat, I don't go into that setting and I remote in with the parents. So it's been just as powerful and it helps you to stay connected and they are still learning. So we always say presume competence. You know, that's something Louisa said, and I've taken that and run with it. You presume competence. We never say can't. It's how can we? make this happen. So um, if anyone wants to learn more about that or wants to know more about what we're doing in Maine, in my district with that, I'd be happy to share that or have conversations off, off of this for that thanks, purpose. Thanks so much for sharing that, Hillary. We really appreciate it. That's some really powerful information. You're welcome. So we, we are right at nine o'clock and I want to be respectful of all your time being here at, uh, at nine o'clock on a Tuesday evening. Thank you so much for being here. You are the leaders in in so much of what positive things are gonna happen for students during this uncertain and unique time. Uh, so thanks for being a part of this. Stay connected with us. We'll make this recording and the chat available. We'll also combine, like I said, all of the tweets from the, from the Twitter chat and make that available on our website as an archive. The link's been posted for you to fill out the survey and get your professional growth points for tonight. Uh, and thanks so much. We appreciate you all very, very much. Have a good evening.